live. Hi, here we are again. And hearing words of wisdom, let it be in the wisdom factory. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the wisdom factory, a forum for open minded people like you and us uh, who have knowledge, experience, and wisdom to share with the world. I'm Mark Davenport. And I'm Heidi Hernlein. And our topics will cover many areas of human experience. We invite people who not only have interesting things to say about their topics in their lives, but who also have an evolved perspective on themselves and what they're doing. They all feel inspired to contribute to the creation of a better world by helping people gain a better understanding and perspective on what is happening both in the world and in their own life and what they can contribute to the resolution of the many problems we're facing at this moment in history. Yeah, and today you are watching the 13th episode of The Wisdom Factory and it is entitled Birth Consciousness and the Divine Feminine and our guest is Barbara Carlson. But before we introduce her, some words about us. We have created this series because we want to bring out into the world our knowledge and experience of 60, respective 70, 70. <laughs> years, and the things we have learned, and they have opened our vision of the world, what it is all about. We both were attracted to integral theory many years ago, which deeply changed our lives. Professionally, we are counselors and coaches, and especially for thriving relationships, as we are having, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> finally, after so many tries. And we run here an association, a retreat and guest house, which is called Paradiso Integrale in Umbria, in Italy. And you are very welcome to step by. Mm -hmm. Now, about our show today, the complete title is Birth Consciousness, Formative Consciousness, Natalism, and the Feminine Divine. And our guest is Barbara Carlson. Hello, Barbara. Hi there. Hello. Hello. It's so and, good to have you. Yes, really. And Barbara holds a, a master's degree in somatic counseling psychology from Europa University in Boulder and is currently a PhD candidate in the Consciousness Studies program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Her area of research is eco philosophy, birth consciousness, and the feminine divine towards an integral futurology. She's a transformative, transformational, I should say, movement teacher. She's been teaching movement based work for the past 25 years and has co led wilderness quest journeys in her work with uh, Emily Conrad, the founder of the Continuum Movement. She started with familiarizing herself with pre-conscious bodily states and primordial anatomy. She studied somatic psychology and pre- and perinatal psychology and gained a deeper understanding of birth consciousness, formative consciousness, and nasalism. Wow, Barbara. Whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> All the things you have done, that is really, really great. Mm -hmm. So, the title is, as we said, Birth Consciousness, Formative Consciousness, Natalism, and the Feminine Divine. The Feminine Divine, we hear often about it, and somebody understands this about it, and somebody something else, but Birth Consciousness, Formative Consciousness, Natalism, what is that? Could you explain us a little bit these concepts? Yes, of course. So, Birth Consciousness, Formative Consciousness, natalism and the feminine divine, I call these four powers the originary forces or powers. Originary, of course, being capital O, R I, uh, O R G I N, as in origin. So they're mm -hmm. the four originary powers that, or, or universal processes, we could say, that are, um, integral with uh, human, human creation and human existence. Um, 
They provide symbolic wisdom, synergy, and support um, for the feminine as a source of profound intelligence and transformation. And when I say feminine, I'm including the earth in that consciousness as well. So in other words, one could say that these four originary powers are the maternal matrix for the new human unfolding, the new human being, the new human species. Mm -hmm. That Sri Aurobindo talked about with his companion, the mother, and of course, Sean Gebser. So these concepts have been around and I have brought them together within a framework and a methodology so that we can actually work with them and invoke them into our uh, continued development and evolution. Thank you. But I still have to ask you, what does birth consciousness mean? Is it the consciousness that a baby has at birth? Or no, from the birth Okay, so I'll go through each of them. So birth consciousness is the consciousness of birth. And every one of us have had a human birth. It is the consciousness of having had a human birth and we all share that and it's an embedded consciousness within our body, a cellular memory you could say, an anatomic cellular memory that is inherent in our cellular wisdom. By having had a human birth, I have come into the world, the birth consciousness of my uh, entry into this world is still in my anatomic memory, anatomic cellular memory. Mm -hmm. Formative consciousness is how I shaped my body. Some people call this embryogenesis. It's how the embryo develops from one cell into a human being with billions of cells and complex systems. So that, that you could say would be our formative consciousness another word being embryogenesis, but I like to use formative because the human being, you know, just because we're not an embryo anymore doesn't mean that we continue to shape and reform our bodies. All across the developmental lifespan, we are changing, we are shedding cells, we are growing new cells, we are generating tissue, we are growing, we are shaping. It's, it's inherent in our body wisdom that we continue to form and shape our bodies across our lifespan. Mm -hmm. And then of course natalism is the pre and perinatal framework of which I've studied and it provides a wonderful framework and methodology for the connection between the infant and the mother. The um, mother is so integral to the uh, birth of the human that it cannot be separated out. So natalism is the beginning, it's the beginning of how we come into existence. And we can't do that alone. We have to have a feminine or, a, or not necessarily a feminine, but a caretaker or mother or caregiver that is synonymous with that, with that love and unfolding. We are social, human, relational beings and we need, we need the contact of another human in order to come into being. And then the feminine divine is the consciousness that's pouring into the earth right now. It's an environmental movement, it is ecology, it is the uh, imbalance of the patriarchy. I mean, this is happening. We see it all around us. So we really are poised for the birth of a whole new human species with all of these factors coming together at this critical juncture in our, in our history um, makes it possible to really participate in our own human um, evolution and unfolding. Well, I think many of us feel like something new is coming and is, is emerging now at this point in history. And uh, I'm just wondering if, if you could uh, express some of these things in concrete terms. What, 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 what is coming to be? How, what is the evidence? Where can we see this 
happening coming out in nurturing? Is that, a, is that well, a... uh, yeah, I think that most um, most people uh, feel alienated and separated from uh, the part of themselves that is connected to everything else. And um, when I teach uh, these four originary powers, I always teach them in nature, in a sacred place in nature, so that people can receive the, the ultimate connection that I believe we're all searching for. Um, you know, that, that return of, of, of being connected to a source that we felt as an embryo in the mother's womb. And we, and then at birth, we are separated from that connection. But I believe that it lives on in us as a yearning that can't, that, 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 you know, a yearning that doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. However, when we are in nature, when we place ourselves in nature and um, open ourselves to the nourishing abyss of the great mother, which is nature, we receive are mothering all over again as if we were this embryo back in the womb. And not only that, but we also receive wisdom that is part of um, cosmic evolution. We receive it as anticipations in our body. We breathe it in, we feel it. We, we are intimate with the very forces of what brought us into existence, even beyond our own familial mother, the great mother or the mother of all. So these originary processes are meant to place the human within the dynamics of the planet, and not our own small ego self, but within the dynamics of the planet, rather than the planet in the dynamics of the human. It's, it's almost like we got it all wrong. So we're placing ourselves back into the uh, dynamics of mm -hmm. the planet. Mm -hmm. as, a, as, as, a pro, as, a, as a planetary process, a human in a planetary process. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge our listeners, our watchers. And here is, for instance, a comment from Nancy and Staley. And she says, Participating in our human evolution by taking action with what feeds and nourishes us and heals our sense of separation. We have inherited in fragmenting times. And I see there is also Michael Thomas and let's see who else is there. Roland Takaoka. Mr. Lin is there. Let me see. I, I don't find anybody else, but thank you that you are here yeah. and uh, listening to uh, Barbara. Barbara, I would like to ask you, how come that you are so interested in this topic? <laughs> I'm interested in this topic. I'm very passionate about this topic. Um, when I was teaching movement, I've always been interested in movement as a means for nourishing my own um, self, you could say, and also I've always been very curious about the body and what is a body capable of. Um, I guess you could say that's been the sort of passion that's been fueling my whole development and education, both personally and professionally. So um, when I was teaching movement, I always taught a very um, slow type of movement. I was never into fast movement. It was always more sort of um, organismic or natural movement. Um, I studied continuum with Emily Conrad and it was a movement that was very fluid and organismic. So um, when I taught movement and created uh, space for movement, I always would observe that uh, people would have this these birth motifs. I call them motifs. And um, people would have spontaneous uh, remembrance of, of something from their birth or being back in the womb. That was a very common one, that they felt that they were back in the womb because the movement that I taught was very fluid and very slow. So it would really bring up memories for people about being back 
in the embryo. So uh, back in the womb, sorry. So I became very, very curious about that and started to really dive into that more and more, especially with my work with Continuum and my mentor, Emily Conrad. And what I found was that I was able to differentiate myself from things that had happened in my childhood, things that I felt shaped me as an individual. I was able to differentiate from those and develop a, a comfort and an ease in my body that I never had before. Mm -hmm. um, in the 90s, I became very interested in ecology when I started taking trips to Antarctica and the Arctic. Uh, my former husband and I had a uh, expedition travel company and that's what we did was we led expeditions to Antarctica and uh, the Arctic and also Svalbard in Europe. And in, in, in these trips, I felt the power of the mother, the power of the potential of human unfolding. And I felt myself so small and part of this huge planetary process that I was just one part of. And I would come back from these trips really full of life, full of life and, and, and burst in love with life, I guess you could say. So full of life and totally in love with life. Mm -hmm. So and so I started to put these things together and I thought, wow, you know, nature is a mother for us. Uh, and we never stop getting our mothering. Our mother continues even though we're not children anymore. We are still a child of the great mother. We are still part of this exquisite planetary process that is forever unfolding. And we either participate in it or we go, you know, we don't. And I know that when we participate in it, there is an intelligence that does not come from the mind or the rational. It is an intelligence that's very body oriented, that nourishes the very cells of our being, which from which, you know, all of evolution is in our cells. Our body is basically uh, a representation of the outer body of nature and cosmos. <laughs> Yeah, this is, thank you for that. It's a little bit almost uh, already answering another question yeah. which we would have. How is this relevant for our times? I mean, a little bit you mean this already. Yeah. Why not? Yes. <laughs> so, um, the reason I, I feel that these four powers, uh, birth consciousness, formative consciousness, uh, natalism and the feminine divine are so relevant for these critical times is because we are at an epoch in our uh, history and it's almost like we need a new story a new cosmology a new a new hope for uh, sort of participating in a the birth of a whole new story a whole new consciousness um, the birth of a uh, continued evolution, um, a symbiosis. I mean, I could go on and on, but I think the most, the most basic thing is that the human has become so separated from the, our genesis, our origin. And um, the technol we, we don't even interact with, with humans anymore. It's becoming very much a virtual reality where, you know, we have we don't have face to face communication, we don't have body to body interactions. Um, we are on our technology, I mean and and we live in a virtual reality and we don't even have to come into contact with humans or with nature or the great mother. And that's, that's a little concerning for me because that opens the question then, well, what is human and, 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 and why do we even need a human form? You know, I mean, these are questions that uh, I feel are very, very important to ask at this time. What is a human and a human body? Uh, what are the definitions of, of that? 
and what uh, would it be? What would it become when we go ahead in this way? Uh, I would like to bring up a comment here from Nancy again. And she said, movement we participate in is a powerful way to shape and differentiate who we are, to grow comfort in our relationships with our bodies, the potential of who we are, and what is unfolding in our lives to fall in love with our life on this planet. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Yeah. He and, sums it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to continue to ask you about this body thing. Because I know there is a little bit of a difference between male people and female people. Often, females have an easier way to access their body because their biological function, they are just forced to, to get to know their body in a certain way, while male can pretend never to feel the body. And I, I even heard a spiritual teacher saying, you could go through your whole life without ever seeing uh, feeling your body. And I thought, oops. <laughs> <laughs> As if that were a worthwhile goal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us more a little bit I'm about the connection of the body and why it is so important that we get into real contact again with our bodies. Mm -hmm. So then, yes, I mean, the body is our threshold for our interconnection with everything, with each other and with the world. It is the threshold of sensation and uh, sensuality. And if we are disconnected from our body, we don't feel, we don't have a connection, we don't um, feel our flesh even. We can think that we're minds and we are, you know, conversing and communicating in technology and virtual realities where, you know, we don't even stop to actually really feel our skin. Part of the work that I do in nature is actually getting people to feel nature through their skin, breathing in the breath of, na of the mother, you know, f smelling all of these, like, very basic sensations and senses are a way into her and as we open to her then we can receive as I said all of the wisdom both seen and unseen I mean we know that we, we can measure certain things in nature and the wisdom of nature but then there's a lot of wisdom that we can see that's so small um, but we know that it speaks to all of nature because we see the buds opening, we see spring coming into form, we see these stirrings that are obviously part of some greater plan. And as a human, we are part of that. And so if we're removed from that, we don't feel those quickenings, those stirrings. We don't feel the rejuvenation of whatever it is that nature does to our soul, our human soul and heart. Um, you know, it, feeling that we exist within some greater plan and that we are part of some greater process is a very exciting thing. Rather than feeling like, oh, well, we're doomed. Oh my God, this is awful. I feel so alienated. Uh, it's too late. Um, I mean, all of the doom and gloom we hear. And then you know, these workshops that I do are really about falling in love with life. And I think to get us through this bottleneck that we're in, we have to fall in love with life. This is wonderful. You know, I, I, had, I have to comment because growing up in a very traditional male way, I, I, <laughs> I was taught to ignore my body because that way I couldn't do difficult things. Uh, I, I couldn't get into dangerous places. I couldn't be scraping my knuckles as I did jobs. You know, I, I had to, I, I'm even, even today, uh, Heidi is amazed at how I, I come home with a, with a cut on my hand and she says, how did that happen? And I can't remember. You know, I wasn't there <laughs> when it happened. And, uh, and I know very much about this uh, separation. You know, I, I thought of myself as a, as a head on sticks, you know, after a while, and and, uh, and that was that was my life in, in, in my head, because uh, 
I, I was never, there was no encouragement to live in the body. You know, there was no profit in it. There was no uh, cultural payback for that. Um, so I, I, I love to hear about these kind of changes coming. Yeah, and you know, I want to add, since we are together, and it's not long, it's three years, he was so astonished to find out about all these things. You mm -hmm. know, it was wonderful that he followed me in many, many, many things, and it's, it's also one of the reasons why we are together yeah. and why we are doing this together. You know, Even to though I was intellectually very advanced. Yes, I you were. <laughs> <laughs> a head on sticks. Yeah. I mean, I was too for a long time, and it took me the same work to come over from the masculine way of being, you know, in the head, thinking. It was only about 10 years ago that I discovered I could live in a place which is different from my head. I didn't know that. I didn't know how that felt. Now I know, mm -hmm. but it's a long time that I lived somewhere else, but not in my, in me, let's say. So, knowing yes. a lot, yeah. but not feeling it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, knowing and feeling are just two different uh, layers of, of, of experience. You can know something, but then when you really actually feel it in your heart and in your body, and you have a knowing about something, it uh, penetrates much deeper. And um, I think this is, this is the aspect that I believe is so important, that we need to feel things in a way that bring us alive, because we are in a culture of speed and numbness and distraction, and we are pulled away from ourselves all the time. And there isn't a lot of opportunities to really feel into yourself. Um, so this work is really about finding your way back to yourself and giving your body the mothering that it needs in order to continue to flourish. And let's face it, in these times, uh, it is so important that we find a way to nourish and flourish ourselves so that we're not so dependent upon supplements and all these other things to help us feel like we are uh, giving ourselves some nourishment. Uh, I think all living systems, including nature, uh, plants, animals, as you know, animals love to be nourished and, and touched and felt. and So, you know, it's that aspect of ourselves that I feel that we've lost and that we need to really remother ourselves to, to the very basis of, of what it means to be, to be human. Yeah. I want to address a little bit the fear of people when they feel that they might feel something which is not comfortable. And so it's better not to feel. I think mm -hmm. this is a, one of the reasons why it is so difficult to, to you know, to, to, to begin a path like this. To, to begin a path yes. to become familiar with yourself and your own emotions. There's also the fear of becoming too emotional. You know, and <laughs> that is not what you mean with feeling. <laughs> no, I mean... Uh, one of the things that I love about doing this work in nature is that nature does not really have a pathological process. It's more sort of like, it's not a therapeutic process in the sense of a, of a uh, therapeutic paradigm. Um, and I got this, this knowing about that when I was traveling in the Antarctica and in the Arctic so much was that I would watch people, passengers, uh, just really feel better just by being out in nature all day. And if you ask them, you know, well, what happened that you feel so much better? I don't know, they would say, but I just know I feel better. So it's almost like um, when we're in nature, there's a process that is unseen that gets activated and it, it, it has a psychotherapeutic effect and um, there's no steps or no methodology to that, it's just, or process for that matter, it's just we feel better in nature. 
we feel better when we are part of feeling like we are part of nature. So uh, a lot of the uh, emotions I think that scare people are feelings of not being connected to anything or alienation and everything always feels much worse when we're alienated, isolated or disconnected. Coming into contact with nature makes us feel better and then from that place of resource then we can then find the support and of course my, my workshops are always done with groups and we hold that feel for each other and reflection and acknowledgement. Um, so nobody feels alone. We are part of a group and we are also part of this greater uh, matrix which you know I call the Great Mother. So you're putting in support that is really, really crucial, I think, for people to even feel some of, of what they need to feel. And a lot of that is really quite a lot of deep grief and alienation about what has become, what has become part of this, you know, contemporary story that we're living, which is that we need to put ourselves in the right order of things. We need to get back into the right order of things. Um, the human uh, within the dynamics of the planet as opposed to the planet within the dynamics of the human. This is so right. Yeah. And I think I wanted to mention that I'm living here in the country for 25 years now and I think it was the intuition that nature would help me to to be in some way. So, and it is interesting. We are doing a, a challenge here on the on Google Plus, and today the question was, what can you? What is it? What you cannot miss? Um, how is it? Without what can, you, what can you not live without? What can you not live without? And I replied, nature. And it's really for me. <laughs> well, I live in a redwood forest in northern California, so I. I can't do without nature either. <laughs> okay, we have some comments. There is Roland Takaoka. He said, knowing does not mean understanding. We were talking about that. Mm -hmm. And then it's Michael Thomas. I agree with you, Barbara. But I truly believe you have to love yourself before you can love life. This is an interesting perspective I would like to, to ask you afterwards to uh, respond. But there's another one. From Nancy again, knowing, experiencing penetrates and brings us alive, brings us alive to who we are, an important place to find so we can nourish and flourish according to our natural designs. Mm -hmm. And she thanks you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we need to love ourselves before we can love life? I'm sorry? Do we need first to be able to love ourselves before we can love life? Well, my experience is that we can do both at the same time. When I do my workshops in nature, part of the preliminary process before we even start to open to nature and life or loving life, we start with our own body. You start where you are. So breathing, sounding, touching into our body, sensations. I have a whole uh, protocol that I go through where we are gazing at nature, where we are smelling nature, where we are opening our skin and flesh so that we can feel uh, the breath of the mother on us. We call her the mother because she is the mother of all, uh, the great mother, the primordial mother. Um, we lay our bellies on the earth. We lay our hearts on the earth. We lay on our bellies and we breathe. Um, just like when a baby is born, they take the baby and they lay the baby on the mother's breast and uh, abdomen. And for hours, the baby will just lay there, breathing with the mother. Um, so we reenact some of these developmental uh, stages of actually attaching and bonding, uh, first of all, to, uh, to ourselves, 
uh, with our own body. Some people haven't felt their body for a really long time. So there has to be that uh, uh, sort of coming home to yourself first. And then through that, you can then open up into uh, feeling this greater connection with uh, earth, with mother, whatever you want to call it, spirit, you know. And then, then there is a uh, reciprocity uh, that happens that is really quite magical. And um, so, yes, definitely loving yourself is part of the process. Uh, and uh, I always start with self first and then opening out. And that's just seems that just seems to be the best way to do it, to ground here at home first and then open out. Yeah. I've been projecting forward here and imagining a time in the future when this memory of separation will be part of our inheritance, but no longer be where we are at the time. You know? So it just the, this growing feeling of separation as culture has developed. You know, we reach a point where, oh, we can't go back. You know, there's too much good stuff here, but let's move forward to a new integration where all these things are included, including the pain of separation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I think a lot of people feel that pain of separation and they think it's their relationship, they think it's their health, they think it's something that happened in the past, they think it's a you know sort of uh, the conditions of, of their of their life for their family when really one of my mentors uh, uh, often said to me it's the pain of, of losing the connection with 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 the great mother mm -hmm. and that mentor is Joanna Macy mm -hmm. uh, she calls herself an eco-buddhist and she says that a lot of people feel pain today and grief about what's happening to our world and um, cannot differentiate themselves from that pain because we are part of her. We feel her pain. It makes sense that the human being can't be flourishing if the mother is, is not. Mm -hmm. um, we have this reciprocity that I mentioned, this interconnection. We are part of her. She is part of us. And if she's in pain, we will feel her pain and grief. Mm -hmm. So could we say that much of the pain individuals feel today might have to do with their own history, but it's in some way also impersonal, that it has to do with humanity in evolution at this moment? Yes, I do believe that. And people will tell me that when they come to my workshops, people will say to me, I feel so much grief, surely this can't all be mine. Mm -hmm. And, you know... It's true when they look back that, yeah, there are conditions that could have caused that grief, but the grief that they're feeling is beyond anything personal. It is a, uh, I think, a processual uh, grief that is part of uh, wakening up and feeling what's actually happening as opposed to uh, staying distracted and numbing ourselves so that we don't feel what's really happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's a comment from Michael Thomas, which fits in very well. Do you want to read it? Michael says, awareness is the first step. Awareness of where you are, aware of threads you are involved with, aware of definitions and directions, and aware of results of experiences then aware of yourself. Mm -hmm. Progression, you. yes. And mm -hmm. there is uh, another comment from our mm -hmm. beloved sister, Miss Delane, and she is living in the Arctic Ocean, not in, but... <laughs> <laughs> on the coast of the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she is writing to you mm -hmm. Okay. She says, <clears throat> great comments, Nancy Ann Steely, one of our other uh, watchers. I completely understand how being present in our bodies has a big impact on how we feel and interact with our environment. 
When I work with people, one of the first things I do is a posture check-in. This is a nice affirmation and reminder of the importance of my practice. Yes. That's another aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are talking about your workshops. Would you like to tell us a little bit more concrete things, how you work, where you work, how people can reach you, how people could participate? Yeah. Yeah. So I always hold my workshops in nature. I think that um, we receive a lot from nature, as I mentioned earlier, both seen and unseen. Um, when we place ourselves in nature, we become part of the biomorphic unfolding, the, the uh, continued development, and uh, part of a planetary process that I believe uh, is happening all of the time. Um, so that is a big part of the mothering that I feel we need. And um, so I always hold my workshops in nature. I have this beautiful garden in the middle of the redwoods. Um, and I hold workshops here I'm in Northern California, just outside of San Francisco. And we usually spend a day. Um, so people will come for the day and we spend the whole day outside. Um, they bring mats and they bring a lunch. So there's a sense of community building as well. And um, so we start out with uh, tracing our development from a cell all the way up through to an adult. All the while we lay ourselves on the earth. So most of this is done by laying on the earth. So when I say we trace our development, we, you know, we, we, we start out by remembering that we are cells, and, and, and then we uh, trace our development uh, up through from a baby, when a baby starts to uh, roll on the floor, and eventually they turn over, and they start to crawl. So all of this is done very, very, very slowly, very slowly reenacting how we actually grew our bodies. And all the while that this is done, we are held in the, in the nourishing uh, wisdom of the mother. And we feel her, we smell her, we, um, we acknowledge her all the time. So there is, there is an intention set from the very beginning that we are going to reshape and reinvent ourselves within this incredible bio-wisdom that surrounds us. And we do rituals that, you know, sort of uh, help us to feel part of her. Um, I always encourage people to, to go into the garden and find something that really speaks to them from the mother. And they take it back and they work that into uh, their particular process that they're working on for the day. And um, so my point in retracing um, the development uh, is that these, if you look at the development of the human across the lifespan, these leaps in development that came, for example, when we were went from crawling to walking, that's like quantum leaps in development. And the body has to organize to do those quantum leaps. So there's surges of uh, sort of, you could say, uh, developmental uh, evolution, or um, there's just surges of bio-wisdom that have to happen for the body to organize around those leaps. Like when a, when a baby is born, and then when a baby turns over, and then sits up, and then starts to walk. I mean, these are all different leaps of development that I believe the, you know, the, the, the structures might not exist anymore, but the, the intelligence of those quantum leaps, of those development, of those steps forward are all still in the anatomic memory. And we can access those by reenacting, by going through the motions again. And now we're doing it in the conditions of the great mother, not of the conditions of her family 
what may have happened, what didn't happen, I didn't get enough of this, I didn't get enough of that. We don't even go there. We're more interested in how can we now, as a human being, feel the immensity of what it means to be alive and to have a body. We, when, we, when we trace our development of a body, most people are astonished that the human body is such a miracle that it can go through these stages and it happens there's no you know there's no it's like it's it's a blueprint unfolding and you see that our bodies are really not static they are very transitional and so it makes sense that we are continuing to develop and uh, you know transitioning always into something else and by using these originary powers and putting ourselves in nature, we really are, you know, poised to gain a lot of um, wisdom that I believe that cannot come from any other source. This is wonderful, Barbara. And you have named so often wisdom today. I think nobody ever has done it in our show, which is That's called true. the yeah. Wisdom Factory. And I thank you very much. <laughs> wisdom Factory. Well, I think the body is Wisdom Factory. <laughs> well, actually, the Wisdom Factory, yes, you know. So would you like to share uh, what when is your upcoming new um, events? Mm -hmm. Well, um, this Saturday, um, Valentine's Day, we are having an all-day retreat here in the Sacred Garden, and um, if anybody would like to, if anybody's in the area of Northern California, San Francisco, you can partake in that. Usually, the last Saturday of every month, I hold these all-day retreats where I, um, where people come, and we we are in the garden all day, and we are going through some of the um, things that I just mentioned, the developmental movement. But I always have a theme, and there's always something new. And um, so if anybody would like to get hold of me, um, my website is embodywisdom.com, or you can Google Barbara Carlson workshops. And um, yeah, I also travel and teach. Um, I'm teaching a workshop in Seattle in April and I'm teaching a workshop in Vancouver Canada in um, September and I'm planning one for uh, northern Canada in Nova Scotia for some time in the summer so I speak at conferences I um, teach here in my home in northern California and you can find out my schedule by uh, you know uh, contacting me directly. It's usually the last Saturday of every month unless I'm traveling. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to do a TED Talk very soon oh. about this work as well. And um, so it's definitely growing as people are hearing the message. They, they feel that it's touching some part of them, inside of them, that they feel that something is waking up when, when they hear this this consciousness or this wisdom. Yeah, there's for instance Michael Thomas is, who was uh, such a beautiful topic today. So it's mm. exactly what you said, it's touching. And I want to give another mm. shout out. I saw that there's Berit here too. Hello and welcome. Berit? And there must be other people here, I know, but mm, there are some hiding and don't write a comment. So <laughs> we cannot know who it is. Anyway, we are really very much at the end of this show, Baba. Would you like to say a last word? I mean, which you really need to get out in the last moment. What should we have asked you that we didn't? Okay. <laughs> what should we have asked you that you didn't? Um, well, um, as well, I, I think that. Uh, no, I think I think I think I've talked really pretty much about um, everything really. Um, Good. Okay. Wonderful. I'll just quickly look at notes, but um, 
This is not a test. No. no. <laughs> and you know, there are some more comments in the comment stream, and it would be lovely if afterwards or tomorrow you would go into the on the event page and answer to these people. It was a great engagement. I, I love you, everybody who came and yeah, see our really, show really and engaged in this way. It yeah. is so mm -hmm. satisfying for yeah. us to mm -hmm. have you here yeah. and to enjoy it. <laughs> and I love the beautiful vision you have of how we have uh, come to be who we are. And what we need to do. That's lovely. And we're on our way to something else. <laughs> oh, yes, we're going back. We're going forward. <laughs> on, Don't on. forget that. Yeah. yeah. We are still So thank you very, very, very much, Barbara. Mm -hmm. It was really a great pleasure and exciting for us too, not only for the watches. And I would like to say about next week. Yes. This will be John Freeman, and he will talk a little bit in this way yes, about blueprints, will. and it is called yes. the science of so possibility. Science of possi thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just read the book. I should know that. You yeah. should know that, yeah. <laughs> so he will surely talk about many interesting concepts, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, thank Great. you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you. Join us too. Yes. Mm -hmm. We'll be here same Good. time. Bye bye. So, bye bye. Thanks so much. Next week. Bye bye.